Side note, while you were in Wisconsin, did you ever go to the Mars Cheese Castle? Yes, I have been there. I pass it all the time. That's the most glorious place ever. I mean, why not put cheese in a castle and and then name it Mars? (laughs) For anyone watching that is passing through Wisconsin, that's the place to stop. Hey guys, Amanda Sayer here with ESPN's Olivia Harlan Decker. I know how big you are, so thank you for making time for me. Oh, thank you for having me on. I'm excited. I just have to say, I feel like I'm bringing this like Skype thing back because last week Molly McGrath downloaded Skype so we could talk. <laughs> now I've got you downloading Skype so we can yeah, talk. Well, school is arriving. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I had to ask you how to do it. Yeah, this is. This is old school, good technology, Amanda. So you've worked with the Packers, you worked with Fox Sports South, and now you're in your fourth year with ESPN after being hired by them at 22. How have you accomplished so much so early on in your career? Whenever I get the question from girls or guys who are trying to get into sports early and they say, what can I do to get my foot in the door? I said, well, go to the door. You know, be at the places you're wanting to be, shadow, intern, everything. Um, My journey started in high school, interning at a local news station in Kansas City where I grew up. Then I started doing some on-air bits on air for a web magazine in town. One story I did was a Gigi's Cupcake opening. So, you know, it's nothing and it's me 16 years old and I'm just standing in front talking about this opening of this cupcake store. But to me, it meant everything. And it's just getting these reps. And now I completely cringe when I watch that because it's like a different person. My voice is so different. My look is so different. But I wouldn't have known how I wanted to grow and evolve had I not just started early, knock out the bad stuff, and get reps. I I say, if you want to be on air, then be on air. Don't fiddle around wasting time in a space you don't want to be. Be doing what you want, even if it's at a really low level. From that point, how have you seen your grow and evolve. I learn something every game. I really do. There are so many times I would say, eh, I wouldn't ask that question twice, or I don't like the way I worded that report, or I kind of botched that injury update. Every game I learn something. So that that's an ongoing process. And my dad, who's in the business, he's 50 plus, I think he's 56. I'm going to have to Wikipedia that, but he says every game he writes down notes of things he wants to fix. And he's done thousands of games. So it's just an ongoing process. I think whatever you do, if you're that type of personality, that kind of perfectionist, I think you are always learning. Tom Brady, every summer he goes back and he strips down the fundamentals of throwing a football. And that's kind of what I think we should do as broadcasters. Well, speaking of your dad, Kevin Harlan, one of the most respected broadcasters in this industry, what were you able to learn from him that you've now taken over into your own career? Well, Amanda, he told me to do anything but get in this industry <laughs> it's so paranoid it's so tough the travel is so wearing and and it's it's just not it's not a kind business and so I grew up hearing that and I'm one of four kids and I'm the only one to ever even look in this direction of a career and I think the more he told me no the more I wanted to get into it a therapist would have a great sit down my dad and me but dad I want to <laughs> I I love my dad so much and he's taught me so much as as a person and how to treat your job professionally and how to how to treat your family and how to treat people you work with and I had such a clear image of the unglamorous side of it but if you love the work then it's so gratifying and fulfilling and for me it is and I watched that in my own house growing up and you know I saw my dad miss so many holidays I saw my dad take so many red-eye flights I, I I swear the man does not sleep and so I grew up with that as an example, thinking, okay, if I'm going to do this, I better be committed from day one because there's not much backtracking in it. Once you're in, you're kind of in. And then if you're lucky enough to get to the level you want and to the games that you want, you feel so lucky every day. Every day you get on that flight to go off to your game. Every day you pull into the underbelly of a stadium to go walk where the players walk. It's so amazing and, and it makes all of it worth it. It really does. Do you feel like you're now at this level that you always kind of expected from yourself? I have always been hard on myself. And with that, I give myself really high expectations. So without sounding arrogant, yes, I did ultimately think I would get to this national level because 
it's, it's like with anything, you don't want to do anything without plans of succeeding in it. That's how I'm wired. But did I ever think it would happen this early? No way. I was ESPN's youngest on-air hire at 22 for a full season package. And that's something that is not lost on me. And I'm now four years with the company. And to me, it's staying around. You know, you can get that first break, but it's about keeping it. That's so hard. Mm-hmm. So anytime someone asks me what, what my dream job is, I always say, I have it. I have my dream job. I just want to keep it. So right now we see you on the sidelines for college football. So we're going to play a quick little game of this or that football edition. Okay. Game winning pass or game winning catch? Game winning pass um, because, oh, is this supposed to be quick? <laughs> No, let's hear your response. Game-winning pass because so much of the game falls on the shoulders of the quarterback. And to make that read in a clutch situation, I imagine, has to be one of the toughest things to do in sports. Game in a dome or game in the open arms of Mother Nature? Well, I just was at Syracuse last week, and that dome is pretty nice. Um, It's just so nice taking the weather out of it, but... So many times the weather is as big of a storyline in a game as anything. So, um, no, it's fun. The the weather is fun. It it changes the game, truly. If every game were played in a dome, we'd have different conferences and different powerhouses completely. Okay, speaking of weather, game in the rain or game in the snow? Snow. Snow games are so much fun. As long as it's not icy, because then players are just slipping all around and it's kind of a hot mess. Um, Snow games are the best. Have you ever fallen? (laughs) No, I don't think so. Okay, not so good. I feel like I just jinxed you. I know. No, no, I'm nervous. Really I'm sorry in advance. If I fall, and I've never fallen in a game. So those are two good things. Not that good. Yeah, let's all do it. Yeah. And I take responsibility for what's okay. to come in your future. I'm talking to you if it happens. I'm going to be mad. Deal, you've got my Skype now. <laughs> I'll Skype you. Okay, underdog or favorite? Underdog, all the way. Underdog games are the best. My favorite games I've covered are the big upsets because you kind of can't believe what's happening in front of your eyes. And I think we're guilty on the production side. We kind of spell out, this is what the coaches said. This is the injury that we know that maybe the public doesn't. And we kind of in our heads put together without realizing it, what tomorrow is going to be. And Mm -hmm. when we're wrong, that's the best. Because then I'm interviewing the coach. I didn't think I would be. How fun is that? And the the emotion when I'm interviewing that coach or that star player, and they kind of can't believe it. Um, It's just so fun, and it's so beautiful, and it's what is great about sports. This is a great little transition into our fan questions, because like Laura Palmer would like to know, what is one of the most exciting or favorite games you've covered? Gosh, just of, of recent memory, this season was Purdue beating Iowa because Iowa was a 29-point favorite, I want to say. And Purdue has the whole storyline with their sophomore, Tyler Trent, who's battling cancer. And they beat Ohio State two weeks before. That was their last home game before the Iowa game. And then, they're obviously, huge underdog. And then they were an underdog against Iowa. And they keep winning at home. And I'm, I'm a person of faith, and I, I, I've got to think that there's some greater reason that, that this is happening in front of this boy who cares so much about Purdue football, um, truly as he's living his last days. So that, to me, was the most like gut-wrenching, like, at, like what we're doing matters. How special was it for you to meet him and be able to interview him? It was so amazing because before and after the interview, I was in the suite with him and his family, and I'm, I'm talking with his family, and he keeps bringing up his faith. And, you know, on national TV, it's kind of like politics. Like, you don't really bring up what denomination you are, what, what you believe in. It's kind of one of those unwritten rules. And I kind of took a leap of faith, for lack of a better word, and I asked him, throughout this journey, what his faith has meant to him. And he gave a beautiful answer. So the interview wraps up and afterwards, I'm about to head back down to the field. And his dad says to me, thank you so much for asking about his faith because no one else has yet. And that to me was so like my eyes filled up with tears because I was like, I, I had this feeling I should ask him. And I'm so glad I did. And I was kind of worried if I'd get a little backlash on it because it's not, I don't know. It's, it's not, it's it's like I said, it's like politics. Like you just kind of don't bring it up. Um, and I, I'm really glad I did. And I'm really glad I kind of went on a limb there. Do you feel like you learned something from that moment? Yeah. Trust your gut. Be a human. You go in there with your list of questions. And I kind of went rogue. I kind of just 
let him guide me. And that was a really good like interview one-on-one for me and kind of almost rewiring my brain to think that. Tim Rushi would like to know who you got winning the college football championship. Ugh, Alabama. And it's so annoying because I <laughs> wish there was a better scenario. And I just don't see that happening. The only, only thing I could see happening to make it a little more interesting is if Georgia beat Alabama in the SEC championship, which I don't think will happen because Alabama shut out LSU and Georgia did so poorly against LSU. So if you just do the domino effect, then that game's going to be awful for Georgia. So yeah. Does that hurt you? Yes, it hurts me. Yes. (laughs) This is as good as we've been in a long time. And I think we, as if I'm on the team, um, I think Georgia's only going to continue to improve, but it's just such, it's like the NBA in the West. Like, you know, you cover the jazz. You can be this good, but it's a race to who's going to lose to Golden State. So it's just, that's frustrating. And I hope in the NBA and college football, there can come a point where there's not the obvious winner before anything gets even started. But this year, Alabama looks as good as they ever have. Okay, Jason Ross Jr., you kind of, touched on this a little bit but he would like to know any advice for college students on getting a first job I feel like if you're in the right position and they always say luck favors the prepared and that is so true in this industry but I feel like if you're good you'll get noticed but you got to intern you got to put yourself there and I think the smaller the market the better like I interned in college at a small news station in Green Bay Wisconsin and they happened to let go a reporter that summer just budget cuts And there I am, I'm free, I'm 19 years old, I'm eager, I won't go home. And so they started sending me out on news shoots and I would drive a little decal marked car and I would set up my own tripod and camera and I'd try to make sure I was in the shot and and do a story on a fire or something serious. And then I'd drive back in this car with no air conditioning to the station and edit it. And then put it on the 5 o'clock news and do a live tag from the newsroom. And I'm 19 years old and unpaid. Pretty sure that's illegal, by the way. But I didn't care. I would have I would have done it free for multiple summers. And I got so much good stuff on my reel from that summer. And I got so good at editing, what I thought was good at editing. I got good at camera. I, I just learned a lot. And by the time I graduated college, I knew three different editing softwares. From my internship at georgiadogs.com from my classes at UGA and the journalism school, and then from my internship at the NBC affiliate in Green Bay. So I just felt well-versed, and I felt like I understood the business. But that was perfect timing when they could use me. So I say find a small town somewhere and find their ABC or NBC affiliate and just start as an intern and then just get better and stay after and fake edit other people's work. Say, can I see your raw cuts and edit them? And can I do a live lead and tag and put myself in your story? That's a great way to learn. And if it never makes air, then put it on your reel. And my first job, they found my reel on YouTube. And and that is truly how this business works. They've got to see it. They never once asked to see my resume, by the way, for my first job. I could have like just gotten out of jail. They would not have known. They just saw my reel and they liked it. I don't know if well, you put good thing that you were in jail because it. that probably would have come out at some point later. <laughs> yeah, we'll be out by now. Chris Toffey would to know what impact has your dad had on your career? He really let me know early how hard it was going to be. Um, and I think that's so lucky. I I truly think I would have been just like everyone else thinking um, you know, if I work really hard, I'll, I'll, I'll get lucky. And I, it's more than hard work. It's like this unrelenting will to be good. I'd be lying if I say I didn't have tears in my eyes after games. And it's just because you work so hard all week and then you get to this game. And if something goes wrong or if someone snubs you or if, you know, if a coach isn't kind to you, which happens, you just, your heart just kind of breaks for a moment. And you just, you know, you, you just... You, you just want so badly for your hard work to pay off. And sometimes it doesn't. And you're like, why? I tried so hard and I worked so hard all week. And I, I sacrificed, you know, being with my family this week. Or I'm missing my friend's wedding or, you know, whatever it is. And sometimes it just doesn't work out. It's something that from a young age, I just, I knew they're going to be. Mama said there'd be days like this. But daddy said there'd be days like this. <laughs> so I, I just, I knew early that it, it was going to be. A grind but the good moments so far outweigh the bad and they so far outweigh the the struggle that 
I just, I, I feel so lucky every day to, to wake up and if it's whatever day of the week, whatever it is to prepare for my game, I, I feel lucky to do that. When you do have those games that don't go as planned or an interview that didn't go the way that you imagined it to, how have you learned to deal with the aftermath and your emotions? You know, Amanda, I don't know that I have. It's so important to quickly move on, but that's easier said than done. So my dad is a huge backbone for me. He's my first call, you know, when something goes wrong. He's my first call. My second call is my husband, and sometimes that is the better voice that I need. I feel like my husband is kind of my way of of getting through it and to move on um, from a bad day, but in our own way. We, we speak the same language, whatever that is. Probably crazy. Like, I could probably speak that language too, so it's fun. <laughs> Good. Welcome to our club. Oh, you don't know, you do have a beautiful singing. Johnny NBA would like to know if you could duet with any artist in the world, who would it be? Um... <laughs> I'm off the table, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, probably Amanda Smith. Uh, I know my answer. Frank Sinatra, the old blue eyes. He is my favorite. I've read so many books on him. I'm so obsessed with him. I used to think my grandfather was him because they kind of look like. Um, I, I just, I love everything about Frank Sinatra. Thank you for being so patient. This has been so much fun and I'm so grateful that you were able to talk with me. Oh, me too. Thanks for having me on, Amanda. We'll see you next time.